research in palliative care. So welcome and over to you. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to uh, share some reflections on clinical trials in, in palliative care. Uh, I don't know how many editorials, letters to the editor and papers have started with, it's impossible to do clinical trials in palliative care. Uh, and many of them go on to explicitly say, and therefore we should not do them. I'd like to challenge that concept today. Um, I looked up uh, this morning, so I had up-to-date figures um, the Palliative Care Clinical Studies Collaborative, uh, about which we'll speak this afternoon, uh, randomised its 1,769th patient uh, yesterday. Now, that represents about 60% um, of the, uh, the, the clinical trial work that I've done uh, over the last 15 years. And uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon is reflect on the challenges uh, and the joys of doing uh, phase three clinical trials in, in this setting. Okay, there's one slight hiccup there. Try again. Beautiful. So one of our challenges uh, really is how do we get a better evidence base? Because if we simply uh, extrapolate as we've done from uh, individual cases, uh, we're going to miss real opportunities to quickly and effectively provide care for our patients. And uh, I'll challenge uh, each of us this afternoon with uh, a few figures to really support that. When we think about what we're doing, I want to draw your attention to the third bullet point, uh, uh, fourth bullet point, third bullet point here. If you're evaluating any new intervention, uh, the, the best way to do that is a randomized control trial. It's not the only way to do it. There are lots of other ways that, uh, that can uh, help us do that, but it is by far and away the best way. And often the fastest way to get to that answer. Um, people say that, uh, that randomized control trials take a long time, but let's step back from that and understand that uh, this is actually a very efficient way to get an answer compared to lots of the other uh, ways that we work around in order to try and achieve that. So over the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, what I'd like to do is think about the care that we offer on a day-to-day -day basis around the world uh, to people with life-limiting illnesses. To consider what I've learned from clinical trials over uh, a long period of time. And finally, uh, to finish with what patients and their caregivers say, because um, again, we may be surprised at their response to the opportunity to participate uh, in a clinical trial. So what, why do we need to improve the care that we offer? What is the learning platform that says we need to do any of this work in the first place? The Palliative Care Outcomes Collaborative is a national point of care data collection that we have in Australia. It covers 85% of all people seen by palliative care and includes things such as uh, point of care symptom, uh, uh, symptom assessment. It means that uh, on an annual basis we're now generating data sets of, uh, of just on 40,000 patients uh, and understanding their patterns of care. What we did uh, to complement that was to say to, uh, to patients and separately to their caregivers, we're going to ask you about how things really are. Now, Removing the clinician from that interface is tremendously important if we want honest responses from people uh, in that setting. And so uh, we chose 49 services across the country and asked them to hand out uh, consecutively um, surveys to patients and to caregivers. We used um, the Palliative Outcome Scale, with which I'm sure you're all very familiar. And uh, um, together with that, um, what did we come up with? Well, when I first showed these data to colleagues, uh, one of my very senior colleagues who'd worked clinically in palliative care for more than two decades said, I don't believe the data. Now, these are subjective measures. Pain is what the patient tells us it is. And the figures are very, very confronting. 83% of people said they had pain. And 25%, one in four people said to us, 
we have pain that is uh, um, overwhelming. How can that possibly be? We're seeing these people frequently, we're seeing them regularly. I'd like to suggest that one of our challenges is that people give up telling us. We see them the first time, we promise them the world. Pain, we're the experts. These other people who've been looking after you just don't know what they're doing, but we're the experts. And we see them the next time, how are those changes I made for you last Tuesday? Uh, perhaps a little bit better. Well, we can, we can make some more changes. We've got more changes to make. And we see them a week later or three days later, how things go. Well, Perhaps they're a little better. And by about the fifth time, people simply shrug their shoulders and go, it's fine. And they've given up telling us what's actually happening for them. And uh, if you look at other symptoms, again, just under one in five people had severe or overwhelming symptoms. <clears throat> These are not figures for the faint-hearted. And as we come to the patient willingness to participate in these trials at the end of uh, today's talk, I want to challenge you with the fact that it may well be a reflection on the symptom control we are actually able to deliver. What about caregivers? One in five said they had severe or overwhelming anxiety. We expect that people are going to provide this care. We don't ask them. How often do we actually say to a family member, are you prepared? willing and able to provide this care. We expect it as a filial duty, and yet uh, this suggests that, uh, that this is a real challenge for so many people. We've known that, but how do we action it? And so uh, uh, there are three slides, I think, today, uh, one line is from colleagues. When we first started to talk about running a, a program of phase three trials, one of my colleagues said to me, but I have no problems getting these medications from the pharmacy. What about their general practitioner? What about their medical oncologist? What about having a registered indication for that uh, particular uh, medication? So this is not about uh, palliative care services. This is about the support that we offer across a health system. It's ensuring that if, uh, if patients with life-limiting illnesses need something, then uh, they can uh, actually access uh, the therapies that they reasonably need. Now, the challenge for us in this population as we think about it is that this is an incredibly unwell population. And uh, we need rigorous uh, scientific knowledge to underpin the entire lifespan. Why should that be any different at the end of life? I. Um, I think that uh, as, as we look to uh, many of the resources that are available today uh, for clinicians in palliative care or particularly for clinicians looking after people who don't have a lot of palliative care training, we have um, a level of evidence that uh, is not enacted terribly well. So we have lots of clinical opinions out there and those opinions are held very, very strongly. You may have encountered it from time to time yourself. I, I, I certainly haven't. My colleagues aren't anything like that, but you may have. Um, the next challenge is that uh, uh, the quality use of, of medications is not only about the benefits, but equating that with the harms. It's not one or the other. It's both. And you go to any clinical pharmacologist in the world, and they will tell you that this is a fine balance. And uh, we've got people who tend to uh, augment the, uh, the benefits and diminish the harms and vice versa. Uh, it's a matter of a, a net effect, which is both benefits and harms. If we're only awake for 30 seconds this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world, this is it. This is the frailest population. And the biggest challenge for us is that any iatrogenic harm is likely to be irreversible. Once you start to tip people to a more rapid functional decline, the ability to, to actually draw back from that is extremely limited in our population. I suggest that that means we have to have the best evidence base in the world, 
the very best evidence base if we're going to uh, provide care. We've got one opportunity to get this right. And that opportunity is often within a very narrow window. And so we need to think about uh, the patient population we serve in great detail in that regard. Um, we can and do cause morbidity and premature mortality. I tried to introduce, and successfully did so, that palliative care was part of the routine hospital mortality and morbidity meeting for our freestanding hospice. People couldn't understand why we would need to be part of a mortality meeting because these people were going to die. And if that's our attitude, we are selling our patients short. They deserve the very best care underpinned by the very best evidence. So to that end, the Palliative Care Clinical Studies Collaborative was born in 2006. It was a competitive process from our national government. Um, it grew out of the fact that uh, palliative care had been very successful in saying we need better access to medications in the community. And government came back and said, we will support this as long as you don't ask us to change legislation or regulation. And so there were a number of medications that were not going to be able to be registered for the indications we wanted in palliative care because the evidence base wasn't there. So here was a unique opportunity, a once in a generation uh, opportunity to actually develop evidence in key areas. To do that, we ran a, a national uh, uh, survey to ask people what were the medications that they used in symptom control for the top 25 symptoms. We asked them what the evidence behind that was, and that was a fascinating part of the, uh, the paper. Don't ever read that paper because it will frighten you <laughs> beyond belief. Uh, we asked the level of evidence for opioids in pain, for example, and had people tell us that it was based on case series alone. Uh, we had people tell us that there was uh, level one meta-analysis data to support a whole lot of things for which there were no randomized control trials. So we put together oh. six nodes. And we've built on that since 2006. Pain, breathlessness, nausea, uh, the challenges of appetite, anorexia, and cachexia, uh, confusion and cognition, and, and bowel problems. Not an exhaustive list, but a list that uh, really has stretched us in, in lots of ways. It asked us to, uh, the contract asked us not only to do the work, but to disseminate the work, and had dissemination plans for each of these. So there was an engagement process uh, with clinicians to, to build this. Each of the studies we did had a trial management committee. We wanted the majority of the people on that committee to be outside palliative care. So for example, octreotide for bowel obstruction. We wanted a gastroenterologist. We wanted a gynecological oncologist. We wanted a, a, a colorectal surgeon. They're the people who need to be convinced by this. We need to know the threshold with which they would need to be uh, convinced in order to, uh, to change their practice. And so it's meant that we've not only had a dissemination plan, but we've run critical appraisal workshops attached to the National Nurses Meeting, the National Doctors Meeting, uh, and the National Panel of Care for uh, uh, several of the last few years. It's a member-based organization. People sign up to it because they want to be part of this. And uh, we've now got more than uh, 20 sites across the country that uh, are uh, joining us. More recently, we've expanded this into phase four work, the post-marketing work, which has been incredibly exciting to see develop. Um, although we've got uh, more than 100 sites in more than 20 countries signed up to it, we've actually got data from more than 50 sites in more than 10 countries contributing. Low tech, high impact. Uh, literally, um, in fact, I, I saw a, an email this morning. Uh, there's a new app that we've developed so that people can do this on the world round with their, their smartphone. Uh, and if they've got Wi Fi there, uh, they can download it. We've got someone in Rajasthan who doesn't have any Wi Fi in the hospital, but they can download it each evening as they, uh, as they go home. So we'll come back to that uh, briefly towards, uh, towards the end. So are such studies feasible? The answer is categorically uh, yes. We're doing this work for off-patent medications, so there is no interest whatsoever for the pharmaceutical industry to invest in this. 
These are medications where if they do the work, uh, any other generic company can come along and uh, benefit from their massive investment. So there's, there's no interest there. Um, it is an arm's length to government, our funders, so we're given a couple of to design these studies, analyze them, uh, and indeed publish them. And uh, as I said, they're considered to be essential medications for symptom control in this population. Six phase three studies have, uh, have completed. Uh, I gave the okay um, as I got off the plane this morning to, to close uh, the six of those, uh, which is uh, a double blind placebo control trial of sertraline uh, versus placebo, obviously, uh, for the uh, management of breathlessness in people who may or may not be uh, anxious, so it's not for its anxiolytic uh, effects. And that's managed to uh, recruit uh, just over 200 participants uh, to a study uh, where they will sign up for up to four weeks of uh, therapy and then to be followed um, until, uh, uh, until death. We've published six phase four studies, five pharmacological ones, and uh, the, the next one is with reviewers at the moment. Um, transfusions in palliative care, do they work? And you've got to collect data prospectively for that. We're never going to do a randomized control trial for that. But we can collect really good prospective data with the same data sets from right across the world. And that's what we've done. So we have the largest case series of blood transfusions in palliative care. Um, again, low tech, um, high impact uh, work that can help us answer uh, important questions. And finally, we've tried to uh, underpin each of these studies with correlative science. So I am going to share a little, uh, a little story here, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Um, many of you will be aware that we uh, did a double blind randomized placebo control trial of ketamine for complex pain. We've done precious little by way of uh, the basic science behind the way we use ketamine. And so um, one of the things we haven't done often enough in palliative care is use healthy volunteers for the basic science side of this, for the pharmacokinetics, potentially uh, for uh, the pharmacodynamics. So firstly, we went to the local ward and said to lots of the staff there, you've all got teenagers, kids in the at university in their early 20s, we're doing a study on ketamine. Now this was one of the most ketamine added units that I have ever come across. <laughs> and they said, you're not going to give that to our kids. <laughs> uh, now this was a much, much lower dose than we were using in any of the, uh, the clinical trials. We, um, uh, it, it, was, it wasn't a bad deal. Um, a, these university students got paid money. B, we fed them. Uh, you know, that's uh, pretty attractive uh, for most university students. It certainly was when I was at university. And thirdly, we gave them a drug that uh, has a street value way, way beyond uh, the value that we were offering in, uh, uh, in the monetary recompense for their time. It's also, when it was given uh, uh, as, uh, as a bolus, uh, a fantastic truth drug. And so here were these um, kids in their late teenage years, early 20s, sharing intimate details about their life for about 20 minutes and having <laughs> no recollection of it whatsoever. Um, my research manager at the time, um, and still is uh, a very um, uh, lively uh, woman from Ireland who has a wonderful sense of humor, she, she was kind enough not to reflect back to these students uh, what they'd said in that 20 minutes, I hasten to add. But really important. You know, we've just seen the big study close out of Edinburgh. What are the pharmacokinetics of, uh, of oral ketamine before we do uh, a really big complex phase three study? So we built in correlative science to almost all of these studies to help us understand mechanisms that underpin them. For those of you who can't see it on the screen, if this medication should cause death, Stop taking it immediately. <laughs> so what have I learned from clinical trials over the last few years? Firstly, we've got to take uh, each of these steps. We've got to find out more about the basic sciences. Even for medications that are in widespread use, uh, we still don't know how they work in palliative care necessarily, and we kind of extrapolate that from other populations all the time. It does mean that we need to run phase two, three, and four studies. 
uh, and some early phase two studies. Our group is now involved in uh, an early phase two study, and that's pretty frightening. Uh, let me tell you, um, you know, we've, we've simply seen that it has been given to, to humans uh, without obvious adverse effects, and now we're moving into people with, uh, with the disease of, uh, of interest. But we need to complement these studies with population-based studies with good qualitative studies, really good qualitative studies. And it's fascinating, uh, uh, again, we've studied oxygen in a double-blind way, um, not placebo control, we've given people air at two liters a minute from a machine that does all the same things and makes all the same noises. Uh, the qualitative studies that have accompanied uh, that randomized controlled trial have probably been as important, if not more important, than the phase three randomized study. And then we need to get to systematic reviews and really high quality their analyses. Um, our symptom control isn't what we think it is. And that's a real challenge. And it's very confronting uh, for many of us in palliative care who are convinced that we're doing great work. And we need to be convinced of that on a Friday night as we go home after a really busy week. But we also need to convince ourselves that there is opportunity to improve what we're doing. Now, the axiom of the day is that I can make anything disappear. <laughs> I just have to get it through ethics. So uh, breathlessness disappears instantly that we open the study. Pain, we've got plenty of people with pain, David. We will have no problems with going to this. And importantly, we have run effectiveness studies, not efficacy studies. Our populations have not been highly selected subpopulations of relatively well people. We have deliberately cast the net very wide to try and ensure that this reflects as closely as possible the real world in which, which we work. But it, it is a great way to make symptoms go away. So I'm a huge advocate for, for clinical trials simply because it improves uh, what we do. Um, we do a lot of descriptive studies in palliative care, and I'm not talking about qualitative studies here, okay? We do some fantastic qualitative studies, and I say to all of my uh, doctoral and master's students, that's far tougher than crunching the numbers. Crunching numbers is an easy part of the world compared to doing really good qualitative work. But the problem is that uh, we know little about the natural history of what we're doing. We don't have the natural history well, well defined, back to bowel obstruction. What is the natural history of bowel obstruction? How many resolve by themselves spontaneously? How many do need medication? How many are amenable uh, to surgery or these days to uh, some of the less invasive procedures? We don't have that, that, those basic uh, data uh, for us. People say we don't have an evidence based in palliative care. This is work from Jen Tiemann from uh, CareSearch. And what we see here is the proportion of uh, academic output relating to palliative care. This is proportion, remember. And it has doubled between 1970 and 2005. <coughs> But the challenge for us is that it's spread out over a huge number of journals. No surprises for, for the top three. Uh, palliative Medicine, the uh, Journal of Palliative Medicine and Journal of Pain and Symptom Management account for a quarter of the output. But look, if you want to look at half the output, I can't even read the titles of those journals on a daily basis, let alone the abstracts. And uh, when we get down to here, uh, we're, we're talking about a vast uh, opus that uh, is really difficult to, to deal with. But I did challenge you before and said that uh, uh, we do a lot of descriptive studies. So when we look at, uh, at this, um, this is 2007. It's Palliative Medicine, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, and Journal of uh, Palliative Medicine. And uh, more than 400 articles were, were published in that time, which 189 were, were ranked as research articles. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, prospective studies were in the absolute minority. So we're really good at looking backwards and saying, this is what we did. Um, and we need to be clear that we've got to change that paradigm fundamentally. Uh, interestingly, we did many more studies on health professionals than we did on caregivers. 
What do health professionals think about X, Y, and Z, rather than caregivers who are doing uh, the heavy lifting? And in all of those prospective studies, want to guess how many were randomized controlled trials? Five. Now, you can argue some of those will have been published elsewhere. Yes, they will. But really, we've got a huge deficit to make up. Uh, we've, we've been doing this for, uh, for 50 years, and uh, we've got a challenge that we're way behind in the evidence base that we should have to underpin the safe uh, progress that we, um, that we make. So the difficulty of uh, running these trials has not been about choosing the intervention. That's easy. Everyone has a bright, shiny new intervention that they want to test. Blood on the floor, got to bring in the sawdust, the hose, uh, and hose it out at uh, morning tea, lunchtime and afternoon tea. It's consistently been about what is the control arm, what is the normal practice in this area. And that has caused untold angst um, in the clinical studies collaborative. And it's been fascinating to watch that process because uh, at the end of the day, um, as you will see, most of the studies have, have ended up with a placebo arm. And that is because there isn't a gold standard with evidence behind it. There are people swearing on uh, whatever they swear on that uh, there is a standard of practice. But uh, when you have 12 people in the room and each has a different standard of practice for which they will live or die, uh, you've got a problem coming to consensus. The other reason for having a control arm is if we just do single arm studies, we will miss the mark by between uh, an underestimate of 90% and an overestimate of 150%. If you take single arm studies and compare them to subsequent controlled studies, uh, that's the difference you're going to see. So we've got to, we've got to have control arms in these studies. A really interesting piece of work, uh, Chris Sampson published this um, uh, a couple of years ago, again from, from the work that we've done. Placebo rates for people with complex pain that appears to be resistant to everything that's been thrown at it, opioids, a whole lot of analgesics, and you say, here's something new. Placebo rates of 30%. No placebo rates as high as that also. And that is that people get toxicities from it, uh, from a placebo uh, that, uh, that can be overwhelming and have them withdraw. One of the things that has struck me from all of this is as we measure baseline toxicities, i.e. the toxicities we want to measure, the baseline rates are incredibly high before we start anything. Far higher than we've reported in the literature to date. And uh, again, that uh, beautiful piece by, uh, by Holmesy back in uh, 2006 of opening the questions, which we're all taught to ask, you know, do you have any problems today? And you get about one problem. You give people a checklist of 44 things, and you get 10 things on the list. You then say to people, how distressing are those 10 things? Because again, we all say, well, they can't be that distressing. In fact, far from it. The evidence is that, uh, that people under-report uh, their distress greatly. So we've got both a placebo effect and a nocebo effect uh, in the studies that we've done. We use this phrase far too often, it's just the disease. In fact, we attribute almost anything to the disease getting worse rather than what we've done. And that's a huge challenge for us because we cause morbidity. We are one of the most prolific prescribing uh, disciplines within uh, clinical practice today. We reach for script prescription pad at, at any moment. And so uh, what we have seen systematically is that we are underestimating the toxicities of what we uh, prescribe on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's look at the ketamine study. And I, we can discuss the ketamine uh, study over a glass of red any time you like. <laughs> That's not why I've got this slide up here. What I want to draw your attention to is, uh, again, the placebo rate. We don't know how to use placebos properly, but there's something in there. And before I die, I'd like to, to tease that out and a lot more than we have. But look at the toxicity sufficient to withdraw when you're still blinded. So these people didn't know which arm they were on. 
17 people withdrew because of toxicity. Now, this is, uh, and I, I don't say this unkindly to, uh, to the other people who researched in the area, but ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. This is the first ketamine study that actually measured dissociation. Now, there's a clue there in the name. And so we've got to look at the toxicities we expect. I remember sitting on the Human Research Ethics Committee and there was a big international drug company study on uh, uh, a new treatment for prostate cancer. It was expected to have cardiac toxicity. So what did they measure? The panic toxicity. We sent it back and said, uh, you're not measuring the toxicity we expect. Octreotide. Now, I have stood at the bedside of countless people on octreotide, and they said, but I've got dreadful colic and pain. And I go, and you've got a bowel obstruction. You do a double blind study, and you find that you may actually be making colic and pain worse with octreotide. Not better. Now, I had to dust off the books for this one. I had to go right back to the original uh, observations of somatostatin analogs. And interestingly, what does ocreotide do to the gut? Well, the net effect across the gut is that it slows things down. That's the net effect. But between the esophagus and uh, the cecum, it actually speeds things up dramatically and then it slows things down incredibly. And so almost all the people in this study had a small bone structure. And they were getting... Uh, they got pumping hard against the obstruction, and we were encouraging that. So again, if we measure it, it's amazing what we'll find. So I do like, like John Maynard Keynes, a compatriot of yours, when the facts change, I change my mind. We can do these studies. The problem is our literature is replete with people saying, we opened this at one site, um, and we're studying something really rare, and after three years we lost uh, interest. <coughs> it was never going to work. We've got 20 sites open, and we can do this. One of the saving graces of the entire collaboration has been that we open trials simultaneously. It wasn't in the original design. We were going to do it sequentially. And if we have done that, we would have failed. Because this way, uh, the uh, research nurses are always busy, always have something to do, because there's always a trial to which they can recruit someone. And it's made all the difference. It's created a momentum all of its own. The collateral benefits have been amazing. Now, we've got a beautiful study that was published um, 12, 14 years ago from the United States in cardiology. If you went to a research active community hospital, you got better outcomes, including your in-hospital mortality, than going to uh, a busy university teaching hospital that was not research active in cardiology. We don't have those same data yet in, in palliative care. We're just starting to see them in oncology. But what we have seen here is that as accreditors have gone around the country, if it's a PACS active site, uh, a clinical studies active site, um, we've had three sites where they have received the highest commendation for palliative care on uh, a site with multiple disciplines uh, because of the work they're doing here, because it spills over into the quality of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I want to draw your attention to Katie Clark's work and the collateral benefits because Katie is passionate about bowels. Unbelievably so, which is a lovely, lovely thing. But what I want to illustrate is, again, we haven't done even the most basic of the basics. This was a study to, uh, to think about how we treat constipation. And so she decided to measure three very simple things, transit time, the structures of defecation, and then evaluate the patients as to whether they had one, the other, or both. Transit times. So she adapted transit times rather than doing a baseline. Give people the markers and do x-ray in five days' time. See what happens to the markers. 
In terms of uh, the structures of defecation, anal manometry, and, and we had people go, oh my God, that's dreadful. Fancy asking people to do anal manometry, which takes all of 30 seconds. All of 30 seconds. Uh, and balloon expulsion. Again, people are gasped that we would do that to patients. The first participant in this study said two things. Firstly, thank you for studying this. This has been the bane of my life for the last several months. And two, you have reproduced perfectly in those two uh, studies exactly the sensation that I have every time I try to open my bowels and no one has taken me seriously. So in 10 patients, um, Katie was able to uh, look at resting pressures, squeeze pressures, cough, and what did she find? Prolonged transit time uh, was, was there for most people. Impaired function of defecation. Is it any surprise you, you lose your pelvic floor? Absolutely no surprise whatsoever. Every other muscle in the, the, the body is, uh, uh, is literally being uh, eaten with cachexia. And so what do the numbers look like? Two people had only prolonged transit time. Two people had only impaired uh, function of the structures of defecation. Five people of the first ten had both. In all our literature, we have never described this, and yet we prescribe appearance day by day, week by week, month by month. Asking some very simple questions adapted from gastroenterology can actually provide us with some real answers uh, in a, a, an amazing way. Um, the next thing I've learned is shooting a messenger is a lie. Well, um, I have uh, a tailored Kevlar jacket, as do several <laughs> other people. Um, but you know, here's a one-liner that I do want to reflect on. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people who've come up to me over the last few years and said that you've taken a really important medication away from us, <laughs> as though I'm taking candy for kids. And what I have heard is, oh my God, that's the toxicity we've been causing. What a contrast. Um, and so I think we've got a long way to go in terms of our maturity as a clinical discipline. Um, and uh, are the studies useful? Well, look, um, we first presented the ketamine study. Uh, importantly, we've done the follow-up study which said, did it change practice? Again, yeah, I'm happy to discuss the ketamine study at any time, but 65% of respondents said they had changed practice. 17% ceased to use the drug, 46% said they used much less, and 2% didn't. <laughs> And I think I know who these people are. <laughs> decided they were going to increase the dose just to show that uh, they weren't going to change just because there was some evidence to the contrary. So what about patients and their caregivers? This is about improving patient care. What do patients and their caregivers think? So again, let's start with a one-liner. For the octreotide study, we um, had as part of our ethical approval the ability to consent people ahead of time. They'd either had a bowel obstruction which had resolved or they were at very high risk because they had widespread peritoneal disease. So we were allowed to consent those people. And in the total cohort of people recruited to that study, we uh, provided advanced consent uh, to 63 people of whom 21 came into the study subsequently. So it was a really important avenue into the study. This person turned up in a ward that was research active with a consultant on that day who said, I, I know you've got a signed consent form here and you've been through all of those processes, but I know this drug works and I'm just going to give you the drug. And the patient said, I want to be on this study. I do not want to be given this drug. I made a decision I want to be on this study. And this consultant said, I'm just going to give you the drug. Now, we talk about patient autonomy. Um, that is a, huge, a dreadful example of actually taking someone's autonomy away from them uh, when they had uh, made a very conscious decision. Uh, that same consultant did it for both the octreotide study and I'm sad to say uh, also for the respiratory study. 
how many of us make the decision that this person wouldn't want to contribute to, uh, to new knowledge without even asking them? Well, they must have lots of other things on their mind at the moment. We, we won't even go there. I'm going to challenge that uh, concept in the next couple of slides. Palliative care patients are likely to be more amenable to joining studies than any other discipline. Now, we can interpret that in lots of ways. At an existential level, you may well argue that this is trying to make sense of a very difficult situation and that if you're doing something like this, you're providing legacy to other people in the future. You're, you're providing a good outcome uh, from a very difficult situation. But are people also telling us that our symptom control isn't nearly what we, we hope it would be? Yes, I'd like to improve symptom control. I'd like to participate in a study that more objectively evaluates uh, what's going on here. So this is work from Claire White uh, that she did um, when she was in Australia before coming back to uh, um, the Northern Hemisphere. Um, clinicians are more likely to refer to non-pharmacological studies, and yet what do we spend our days doing? Writing prescriptions for pharmacological interventions. There was a general unwillingness to refer to randomized controlled trials, and when you've got genuine equipoise, why would that be? Are such studies desirable? Well, look, absolutely. 92% of patients would participate in trials with a simple intervention. That's a fantastic hit rate. And importantly, um, more than 75% of those people said as one of their reasons that they wanted to help other people. That concept of legacy, that concept of making the most of a very difficult situation. And uh, many would be prepared to complete a, a short questionnaire, accept extra medications and investigations, and undertake additional hospital visits. This is a wonderfully generous population. And I think the biggest ethical dilemma for us is not about whether or not we should do these studies. The ethics for that for me is very simple. We are experimenting on patients if we're not doing these studies. The ethical dilemma here is not to abuse that goodwill. Now, in the Palliative Care Clinical States Collaborative, the people who consent are not the caring clinicians. Deliberately, it is at arm's length. And we've made that uh, it's an expensive pastime to have someone else doing that uh, all of the time, but it's absolutely crucially important because we don't want to, um, in any way, uh, take advantage of this wonderful willingness of people to, uh, to be there. So the themes of altruism, the wish to uh, avoid complex studies but retain autonomy are the underlying themes that, uh, that were identified there. So what have we designed? Studies that answer practical questions that are relevant to our clinical practice on a day-by-day -day basis. We've deliberately sought the shortest duration of therapy to see a benefit. So this is not about long-term uh, benefit, but about uh, signal there. Minimize the inconvenience to, to, uh, to patients. Have a population as close to the population of interest as possible with the widest possible inclusion criteria. The matrix at the moment, as it looks, uh, if we look at this um, by uh, by phase across the top uh, and by symptom mode down here. What we're seeing is that uh, uh, there's uh, a body of work that is, uh, that is underway that is, I hope, helping each of us to, uh, to improve the clinical practice that we, uh, that we undertake. Bottom line, these are important studies. They answer practical questions and uh, for the people who uh, are very attached to uh, particular medications, the challenge is do a better study. If you don't like the answer, then, then do a better study. But all of these studies have a priori built into their analysis plans. Can we find baseline characteristics that help us to identify respondents? And for ketamine, for octreotide, we didn't see that. For spirulone, in case you haven't caught up with it, 
uh, and it's now been accepted for publication, so I can talk about it freely. Uh, importantly, uh, if you're on an antipsychotic, risperidone, or haloperidol, you will lengthen the period of time for which you're delirious compared to placebo. How much haloperidol have you handed out over the years? How much haloperidol have I handed out over the years? And if we'd have only done one of those drugs, and it's a fascinating backstory as to why we did two. Um, so a three-arm parallel study. Uh, importantly, if we'd have only done one, we would have shrugged it off and said that there was no any cycle. We did two, and they moved perfectly together compared to placebo uh, through which you can see day off. So these are important studies and our patient population deserves the best evidence that can underpin their care. I'm happy to take some questions or comments. Thank you very much. I think it's very difficult to do a randomized trial um, around blood transfusions. It's not impossible. Yeah. Uh, it certainly can't, uh, can't be a double blind study. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, we, we have to accept that. Um, I think there is work to be done yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. You can do all sorts of things, absolutely. Yeah. Making sure the whole yeah. line is covered. Yeah. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we're grappled with that. And I think our phase four work is, is actually uh, important in informing yeah, what course, else yeah. can be done. So yeah. both phase two and phase four can inform future phase three work. Um, it's just a different way of approaching uh, getting some, some data. What we do in that is, is just have three data points. Baseline, a time to um, acute and immediate harms, and a time to benefit. And you know, if nothing else, um, it, it makes us all think about yeah. what what is the time frame for benefit. If we haven't got benefit at that time point, what do we do? Do we cease it? Do we increase the dose? Do we add something else in? We tend to add something else yeah. in if you actually look at the prescribing patterns yeah. across the system. Um, but it does make us think about that. So both phase four and phase two can inform phase three. I think there's important work to be done there for. Uh, blood transfusion as there will be for a whole lot of others. Um, Hyperdermatosis was on that yeah, last uh, last list, yeah. but then we're, we're moving into stenting, the city taps, um, uh, just about to go to ethics for the sites that require ethics. Most sites don't. This is about routine practice and collecting de identified data. So um, it's a very active uh, yeah. discussion we have, I can promise. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense because those say I think it's like transfusion, that they should be. And the stage of that concept is the same thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd and I'm really interested in the recruitment to unwind control trials and sort of the challenges that people face. And I'm obviously very impressed by you. <laughs> you're going to have to work far harder if that's your qualification. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's standard fair around here. <laughs> I mean, as somebody who is currently working on an RCT, I'm not somebody who's tried to control. I mean, you basically mentioned a few things in your presentation, but you see, I think, important for health and critical treatment, like multi center studies. I mean, are there any other key strategies that you have used within your work that you think are, you know, are very, very valuable to health and critical treatment? So, the biggest single factor is the opinion label on the site. Uh, simple as that. If there isn't someone who is going to champion it uh, at each of those sites, we know it won't, uh, won't succeed. Um, we set ourselves a couple of interesting goals. First is uh, recruitment uh, at each site within eight weeks of uh, they're finally getting a, a tick. 
if people don't recruit in that first eight weeks, um, it's unlikely that that site is going to be a high performing site there. Um, the recruitment staff, um, one of our interesting uh, discussions that's still ongoing, and you know, that's why, why we talk about these things rather than write about them, is should you get a really good palliative care nurse and try and teach them to be a research nurse, or do you get a really good research nurse and teach them some palliative care? I, I think for most of our successful sites, it's the latter. Uh, you need a really good research nurse who can learn some palliative care uh, in order to take on uh, that, that role. Um, I, I think the, the process of, of uh, development of the trial has been important for us. Um, it, it's a bit like when you go to your human research ethics committee and they go, why didn't you do X? And you go, we've, we've grappled with that for nine months. And we've tried to explain that there were eight different possibilities, but we've, we've finally landed on this one. I think having the trial committee as broad as possible from the sites means that they've been part of that discussion and can feel much more comfortable about the study in the first place. Uh, as I say, the, the, the real blood on the floor moments for us have been finding the control arm definitions, but on a day-to-day -day basis, recruitment, key opinion leader, um, third party uh, doing it uh, and really understanding the rationale of what's trying to be achieved in, uh, in the, the, the clinical study. Just following up on the previous speaker, you mentioned that you have a team of randomized control trials across the board, not just public care. There's virtually no studies really properly looking at the strategy to do that. And you've committed your own, same way you said, this is what works. How do you embed any trials within? Yeah, look, um, in short, no. <laughs> um, and guilty as charged. Um, it, but uh, having said that, um, what we are doing at the moment uh, is looking at uh, trial site performance uh, and, and then correlating that with, uh, with some factors. It's, it's a post hoc analysis, but uh, uh, that work is, uh, is being done. Uh, because we've got wide variation um, and the resources available to the site were identical. So this was not, a, this was not an input issue, uh, this was absolutely an output issue. Um, and we were very egalitarian about the resources made available, particularly in the early days, so that uh, we were actually providing infrastructure irrespective of performance. That's no longer the case, so we've changed gradually to performance-based uh, uh, payments. Um, but that was an evolution for us. Uh, so I think that analysis is, uh, is underway at the moment. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what it comes up with. But um, again, if we, uh, if we look to the literature, uh, the evidence is certainly strongly embedded uh, around, uh, around champions um, and, uh, and uh, face validity to a question being, uh, that has been uh, explored. Um, just a question about um, have you trained ethics committees over the 10 years that you've been working and, and have you seen any change? You have to make any, have, have they moved on, I guess, or did you, did you not have problems in the first place in terms of the terms? Well, uh, we had some problems, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you for touching on that. Uh, look, in, in terms of ethics committees, um, uh, ours, as I'm sure um, they are here are all fiercely independent and will tell you that they're independent of anyone else uh, and in that time we've been um, undergoing national change with uh, the expectation that there will be uh, mutual recognition of, of approval. Um, we're still one of these committees that refuse to sign on to that because they're independent. Um, in terms of training them, it, it's, uh, uh, we were at an advantage. We'd already been running phase three uh, studies at uh, one of our most prolific sites uh, and had worked with the ethics committee there over several years. They had become very comfortable. Uh, and interestingly, their basic ethos was if your patient participant information sheet is, is adequate, people can sign up to anything. So their issue was about making sure that people were fully informed in order to give consent. 
Uh, and we had a respiratory physiology unit, for example, that did horrific things to healthy volunteers. Really horrific things by any, any stretch of the imagination. The thing was, this person is fully informed, therefore uh, it, it's okay for, uh, for, for this research to occur. That was a really great starting point um, compared to lots of other uh, ethics committees. So I had to front one ethics committee, um, which actually had a very big palliative care program on campus and in the community. Uh, in fact, uh, a huge program. Uh, they were the most uncomfortable that, that these studies were being done. Fronting that committee, um, they had two Queen's councils on uh, the committee at the time and uh, a couple of card-carrying ethicists who did nothing but uh, uh, ethics uh, all day, every day. It was a, it was a tough, uh, tough group. The other thing that we did very early on, and this really arose out of my experience of sitting on human research ethics committees, uh, particularly where there were lots of industry trials, was to write to them. Uh, and we wrote this up as a, uh, as a short report um, in about 2007 or 8, um, and said, look, you want to be notified of all deaths. We don't want to snow you with all deaths because people will die um, on these studies with nothing related to the intervention. I mean, we've got to do it in the 28 days after the intervention. These were all widely used medications that were registered for something, just not the medication uh, which we were studying. And so we negotiated with them to actually identify um, deaths that we thought in any way could be linked. We would report within 24 hours as required. But if we felt that this was due to expected deterioration and there was nothing that could uh, link this in any way to the intervention, we batch those, send them to the Data Safety Monitoring Committee uh, and, uh, and inform ethics committees far less regularly so that they will not, you know, I mean, uh, literally, you used to get an inch of papers from some of the international trials. Um, and what they had buried about four pages from the end was a really significant uh, issue. And that's the ethics committees, as one, came back to us really strongly there and really positively. Uh, the other challenge for us was that um, uh, the delirium study, by definition, people could not be of informed consent. Uh, two of our states had uh, specific legislation for the guardianship board, a, a third party um, decision maker when capacity was lost. Um, the other states and territories didn't have anything. One of the states said, we don't have legislation, therefore we will not make a decision about this ethics application. So that study did, never opened in that state. Uh, the two states with guardianship boards could not have been more helpful and complementary. Uh, the, the letter back was, why aren't more studies like this being done? We're not being asked to, to, to evaluate studies like this and it concerns us greatly. I mean, what a fantastically positive response. So um, that was the other issue. Yes, there were ethics committees who had to train, um, ethics committees who had to understand what was happening. And uh, it is tough. And there is a parentalism uh, about this that uh, uh, is, is distressing when we're answering very practical questions. This is not about saying this person's at the end of life, let's do a study on something that's totally unrelated to their clinical care. And uh, we needed to uh, really shift that from at times. How do you manage the issue of obviously this patient group are often undertaking competing trials due to the cancer population? So how do you manage your symptom control trials, taking into account the fact that this cancer patient will potentially be involved in other cancer studies? Yeah, I think it's a really important issue. In fact, uh, we've taken the view that if they're on um, an investigative um, compound, uh, that, that we would not take them on these studies. Now, that has cost us dearly in recruitment at several sites that are very trial active in oncology. Um, and we've lived with that, uh, unfortunately, um, because we're always second on the list there. Yeah. We will always be after the, uh, after the new investigational agent has been tried. 
But we have enough sites where they're even not terribly trial active, not just in oncology, but uh, you know, end stage uh, cardiac or respiratory disease, uh, are areas where there's been substantial um, work uh, happening. Um, it's, it's a real challenge for us. I'm sorry, could you just be louder, please? Sorry. <laughs> so we've got like this National Institute of Health Research that provides research nurses and things like that. So, I mean, I do a study with nurses in a research active hospital, and they are actively engaged in as you can imagine, I'm done. And they would put their own inclusion criteria in. And their inclusion criteria are they young? Are they quite fit? Are they quite happy? <laughs> now, that's not the round of character care patients. How do you get around that? You said you did a consensus. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that does vary from, from site to site uh, about how they deal with that. Um, uh, our most successful site actually has every person who has first contact with a patient say, Will you, are you willing to be contacted by someone from a research team? And we've worked to script that, and I mean script it. So that uh, so that, that uh, is happening routinely. Once that's happened, um, really, if people are identified as, as likely to, to be eligible, um, then the steps for us are really we've removed it from the clinicians entirely. Not the decision making, but once they've seen the yellow sheet that says this person's happy to be contacted, it does shift their threshold for engaging. And what we've done is that uh, all of that eligibility um, assessment is done by a research team. So we give two, maybe three bullet points, three absolute maximum. Um, so the oxygen study. Is this person short of breath? Are you thinking about oxygen? Pick up the phone. Don't look at the eligibility criteria. We'll look after that. We'll look after everything from that point onwards. So um, if we leave people going through the eligibility criteria, they will almost certainly exclude people from the study. And the most graphic example of that was the Panicate Care trial, uh, which I think is still the largest randomized health services trial where we had individually consented patients and their general practitioners. We had one subjective um, measure in the eligibility criteria, and that is that the person is expected to die in the next 48 hours. Now, this is a study which we calculated should have taken 18 months to refer to. It was very straightforward, and it was a health service study, so you know it, it wasn't an impost on, on participants or their families. Um, it took us uh, three times as long as it should have, and fascinatingly. Um, I think uh, we had 600 patients who were listed as uh, likely to die in the next 48 hours on referral to a palliative care service. Now, this is a palliative care service where the average time for referral to death was four and a half months. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what the average survival of those 600 was? Mm -hmm. Three and a half months. Mm -hmm. It gave people one subjective uh, measure and they took it. Um, so, you know, I, I, what we've done now is, is step away from that and simply say, I, are you thinking this person's delirious? Are you about to start an antipsychotic? Pick up the phone. And that really has helped in the sites that have, uh, have implemented that because otherwise, I agree that um, the, the gatekeeping and the ability to gatekeep against uh, eligibility and criteria uh, will be used to, uh, to the end of the group. Thank you about some of the qualitative work because you talked about how important that was and I think that pretty much all the trials that were running here have some embedded qualitative work but I'm just interested as to the questions that you asked about qualitative work. What is the, what is the function of it I guess in the trials? Yeah, look, it differs from study to study. That, uh, uh, in the oxygen studies, for example, it was really understanding uh, uh, prescribers' behaviour and then caregivers' behaviour, uh, and then finally uh, uh, patients themselves. 
uh, because one of the things that, that I was in that original work was um, uh, a population-based study. So again, back to that very early slide, you, you need all of the bits. A population-based study in Western Australia where uh, a byline literally buried in a, a report from the Commonwealth Government had that um, people who lived alone were less likely to get oxygen. We delved into that and found that in fact you needed twice as many home visits, you needed to be twice as breathless uh, in order to get home oxygen as someone who lived alone. And so we went to prescribers, nurses and doctors and, and, and asked them, so how do you make these decisions? Are you worried about safety? No, we aren't. Um, so having excluded everything else, then with the papers and said, how do you see oxygen? And we're just doing that with patients now. So um, it really uh, complements, augments um, some of it's done before some of the studies, some of it's done consequently because we've got something we can't explain. So it, it really um, uh, envelops beautifully uh, what we're doing in, uh, in the clinical trials and each is, is quite bespoke. <laughs> Must be online audience. Any questions? Any questions online audience? The last time it took eight hours to type, so the mic, while you're typing a question, oh, oh, can they speak? Can we hear them? They can speak. Yeah, but they're quiet. They're quiet. But they might think so. Can I also just like, because I mean, you've been talking here about uh, trials of pharmaceuticals, mostly. Um, and I guess I've got two questions which you can see. Firstly, is how do you choose out of the many options which trials are actually prioritised? I'm assuming there's some limited budget and not the uh, bottom of the of money. If, if there is, I'm going to where you are. <laughs> um, and, oh, I'll ask that question first, because the second yeah. one is actually about non harm So the, the first one was, was actually um, uh, dictated to us. So those, um, at least four of those studies were from a national, genuinely whole of community, whole of government working group that had met for. Um, three years. So the national survey in 2000, what are the medications you use for the top 25 symptoms, what's available, what's the evidence. That then went to um, this whole of government, whole of community uh, working group. Um, we won the contract to look at the evidence behind that and as a result of that, um, a section of our subsidised Pharmacopoeia uh, was, was created for the first time around patients rather than prescribers. So there's a palliative care section of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme in Australia um, that is derived entirely from that process and it has drawn at almost every meeting of the previous since the pharmaceutical benefits scheme since then, uh, which is in, in itself impressive. There were a number of medications left over um, and uh, that group did the prioritisation. So um, antipsychotics for delirium, really, you know, this is not a palliative care problem, it's a problem right across health, but it has been incredibly poorly studied. So we were asked to uh, actually look at three antipsychotics, and the back story um, was that um, I, I was required to get a letter of comfort from the sponsor company for every medication we studied in that first contract. Now this is a really interesting process because I was going to the pharmaceutical companies and going, I, I want you to, to just give me an undertaking that if this study were to be positive, you would at least be interested in seeking registration for this indication. That's all I was asking. And they kept going, but you don't want money? No, no, I don't want money. You, you just want this letter. Yep. So one of the companies, which will remain nameless today, uh, sent this to head office and came back just four months later and said, no way, we're not going to give you a letter of comfort. We do not want this drug associated with the word delivery in uh, prescribers' minds, uh, which is a fascinating response given the way that that particular drug is being used and in fact marketed. And the company has since been fined um, billions of dollars, not millions, billions of dollars for um, off-label um, 
uh, promotion for that indication. So go figure. Um, so that's how that happened. In terms of that second, of that last slide, um, that's now a collaborative group decision. So we have an annual cycle of meetings, um, March every year. People come, they pitch their, their, their ideas. It's voted on by the membership, free membership. Anyone can join. Um, and uh, we then uh, undertake that we would, we would support the pilot of that. And then we have to go for competitive funding. So um, it's a very democratic process. Um, the figures um, are now the phase four studies as well. Um, very much um, in a way that hasn't been in the past. So, you know, we're really operationalizing those phase four studies, both the as well as phase two studies going forward. And my supplementary question is really not very related to but um, you mentioned the trial date So what lessons do you think we could learn from the pharmaceutical trials to, to run these other related but slightly different, I think, trials? So we've run some healthcare interventions also, and uh, that's a very exciting part of our work. I mean, I think it's an area we enjoy. Uh, it's far more challenging than, than running pharma trials. Um, I, I think the, the commonalities here are Again, back to making sure that we're answering questions that have face validity for a wide range of clinicians who can look at it and go, yep, that makes sense. Um, I, I think uh, what we have probably not done strongly enough uh, in some of the healthcare um, studies around the world is to find what's in the black box. And a uh, little like our conversation as we walked down here today, um, you know, what is it that, that, we're, that, that we mean by this particular intervention? So I think uh, these studies, if nothing else, have, have asked us to really standardize. And that has, uh, again, I stress, has been the contentious issue. Uh, you know, what does this intervention look like? And um, I don't think there are any shortcuts for that conversation. I think it is such a tough area. And if we had our time over again, I'm not sure that we would have shortened that consultation time. I really don't believe it. And, and so um, as we look to complex interventions, um, uh, defining what's in the black box becomes such a crucial part of what we do. saying to our referrers, you're not referring at the right time, and they're going, what do you want us to do? <laughs> and I feel for them, because we haven't done our work internally. We haven't got our house in order to make it easy for people to say, actually, you're doing a really good job. I mean, how many of our consults, um, both in the community and in inpatient settings, are actually validation of really good care? People just want to check. Oh, I still consult the real guys. But I haven't seen someone, uh, you know, with that particular renal failure for a while and go, have I missed anything? Have I missed, uh, in the words of John Quest, the bleeding obvious? Because we hate to do that. And, and so, so much of what we're doing is validating that people are getting great care. Let's see them once. Um, and, you know, I, I did a national consultation, originally a roadshow around the country in 2005, and I consistently asked the services uh, to which I went. What are discharge policies? And most people at that stage laughed me out of the room. What do you mean discharge policies? These people have been referred to palliative care. Well, that's not till death do us part. So we've got both as people come into our, our care and when people leave our care, varies infinitely um, across the world. And, uh, 
Uh, you know, if we do nothing in the next five years, we must get some criteria that we agree on. And I think it's disease by disease. Uh, if we're really serious about uh, refining uh, the care that we, and support that we want to offer people uh, who most need it. You know, we fill our books with people uh, with, with cancer because they've got a cancer diagnosis. Um, that, that's, that's not the need out there as we look at populations. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ruth. Well, I'm way over time. <laughs> Well, there is, we said to have a pack, so we're not quite way over time. I think we can I on time, but I'll give it, we'll probably need to wrap it up. Um, I think there's some opportunities for people to speak to you tomorrow. I'd be very scared about going to see now. <laughs> 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 they will never get to Brussels. Um, but so I think, and I don't think there are any questions online, so just a really huge thank you. I think it's, uh, it's always engaging. Um, and I think we've got lots of questions, so I think we might have to drink quite a lot tonight. I think we to have to do an I'm driving. <laughs> but thank you, and thank you to everyone who's joined us online as well. So uh, hopefully we've got the technology right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, I would say it's really interesting. Because I mean, we're going to start with a question. We'll do that. But it's going to be a little bit more. Yeah. Now we've got.